my talk today is um, based on my doctoral research that asks uh, how does forced displacement influence the dynamics of political mobilization. One could uh, imagine that uh, forced displacement would disrupt, uh, demobilize, and weaken contention. However, uh, my research shows that this is a partial conclusion. And uh, studies of forced migration, or uh, as it is recently called wartime migration, exhaustively focuses on disruptions, losses, victimization, and marginalization. There is no doubt that uh, forced displacement in the context of war uh, leads to uh, a migration that enforces various forms of marginalization, be it social, economic, political, cultural, and psychological. For individuals uh, and families, displacement often means separation from their communities and loved ones, destruction of networks and property, and an uncertain future in an unfamiliar places, often accompanied by experiences of gruesome violence and dangerous journeys. Yet, uh, one needs to ask, uh, are loss and marginalization the only possible results of forced migration in the context of war? What if forced displacement and the process of forced migration open up possibilities for collective action. How might the mobilization of forced migrants affect the organized movements? Having these questions uh, informed my research, uh, I have analyzed the dynamics of mobilization by considering uh, the uh, the, um, by considering uh, how forced displacement shapes uh, the transformation of actors' identities, the restructuring of organizational forms, and the choice of action repertoire. I borrow these analytical tools uh, from social movements and contentious politics literature, and I turn to the uh, Kurdish contentious politics and the latest two episodes of forced displacement of Kurds by the Turkish state in order to investigate this interplay. Before introducing the context for my research, uh, I would like to give a little background for what led me to focus on these questions and how this question resonates with my lived experiences. More importantly, uh, I would like to emphasize that uh, my own positionality has been fundamental to the development of uh, my research and methodological approach. In this research, uh, I focus on Northern Kurdistan, known as Southeast and East of Turkey. Uh, there are more than 5 million displaced Kurds in Western Turkey, and more than 1.5 million displaced Kurds within the official borders of Iraq, Syria, and Iran. The population of displaced Kurds in Europe is estimated to be around 2 million. And as one of those Kurds, uh, I am a child of a Kurdish forced migrant family from Diyarbakir, the symbolic capital for Northern Kurds. And my family had to move to Izmir, which is known as an ultra-nationalist and ultra-secular Turkish coastal city in Western Turkey. My experiences as a Kurdish child in Izmir were shaped by the exclusionary mechanisms of settler colonial social relations in Turkey and Northern Kurdistan. These experiences uh, shaped my political consciousness and my interest in the impacts of forced displacement. And um, this uh, especially this interest uh, paved my way at a uh, later stage in my university years uh, in 2011 to work with the constituencies of the Kurdish political movement through an Istanbul-based civil society organization called Immigrants Association for Social Cooperation and Culture. My activist work for more than a decade uh, on the ground with the constituencies of the Kurdish political movement, particularly the ones that focus on forced migration, and my personal experiences of several episodes of displacement have helped me to observe the role of forced displacement in the Kurdish political mobilization. Uh, what was striking to me at the time was the centrality of Kurdish forced migrants mobilization in shaping the agenda of the movement and the movement's forms of organizing, particularly in the West of Turkey and the Central Europe. And this brought me to explore broadly how forced displacement impacts the dynamics of political mobilization. Coming back to uh, my focus, the Kurdish contentious politics and the latest two episodes of forced displacement, I would like to provide a brief history to introduce the actors of the Kurdish political movement and situate them in contentious politics of Northern Kurdistan. 
One of the main actors that led the movement is the Parti Karker in Kurdistan, Kurdistan Workers' Party, or the PKK. The founding cadres of the PKK were inspired by the upsurge of anti-colonial struggles and Marxist-Leninist movements around the world in their early years of mobilization during the, uh, during the late 1970s. By the 1990s, uh, the PKK had assert, asserted its position in the larger Kurdistan by conducting an anti-colonial armed struggle against the Turkish state as one of the largest guerrilla movements. Since the foundation of the PKK, uh, the Kurdish political movement has considered Kurdistan as a colony of Iraq, Iran, Turkey, and Syria, and identified their primary objective as the liberation of Kurdistan from the colonial rule of these four nation states and the decolonization of Kurds. In the 1990s, uh, the war between the PKK and the Turkish state was intense. This is when the first of the most two recent episodes of forced displacement took place in northern Kurdistan. The Turkish security forces forcibly evacuated nearly 3,500 villages and hamlets, displacing an estimated 3.5 million Kurds. The second episode occurred in late 2015 when an urban warfare broke out in the city centers and uh, towns of Northern Kurdistan in the aftermath of the collapse of the peace negotiations between the PKK and the Turkish state. During and in the, in the aftermath of that episode, Turkish security forces once again displaced more than half a million Kurds. In both episodes, uh, while some Kurdish migrants sought refuge in Iraq and European countries, many others stayed within the borders of the Turkish state. In both episodes, the Turkish state used forced displacement as a counterinsurgency strategy uh, to demobilize Kurds, suppress any claims to Kurdishness and autonomy, acquire territorial control over Northern Kurdistan, and ultimately achieve its settler colonial objectives of removing and assimilating Kurds. Um, in other words, uh, Turkish state uh, used forced displacement as a counterinsurgency strategy to create loyal Turkified subjects and controllable territory. Here, I ask in my research uh, what Kurds did with their displacement and what mobilization strategies they develop in, through, and against their forced displacement. To answer my question uh, from the perspective of the activists, I conducted uh, multiple methods of data collection, including interviews, participant observation, and critical content analysis. For my research, uh, I interviewed for the seven Kurdish migrant activists who were movement organizers affiliated with different Kurdish civil society organizations and working with forced migrants in Northern Kurdistan, Turkey, France, Germany, and Switzerland. I also conducted uh, participant observations uh, alongside with qualitative interviews uh, in several cities of Switzerland, Germany, and France between December 2019 and February 2020. And I participated uh, in large scale protests, panels, workshops, concerts, community dinners uh, that were organized uh, by the Kurdish political movement constituencies in Europe. I supported my data uh, with the content analysis of the documentation generated by both Kurdish and Turkish NGOs, human rights organizations, and international organizations in these multiple sites. My methodological choices uh, have been informed by a sociological commitment uh, to specifically make the state's colonizing practices visible and to denaturalize nation state and their borders through an analysis of the forced displacement and anti-colonial struggles of the Kurdish people. Through these methods, uh, I examine the latest two episodes of forced displacement of Kurds in order to understand their impact on the dynamics of mobilization in Kurdish contentious politics. I analyze these episodes in the history of the Kurdish political movement under three periods that you see on my screen. These periods uh, correspond to key processes and mechanisms that I identify within the research. And this periodization uh, helps us understand uh, how dynamics of mobilization 
in relation to two episodes of forced displacement in Kurdish contentious politics varied under different macro processes. And I identified four different mechanisms uh, marking these time periods that I will discuss in presenting them. For now, uh, let me only name them. There are mainly spatial distribution, migrants mobilization strategies of reconstructing their understandings of identity and territoriality, upward scale shift and organizational flexibility for an ideological change. Now uh, let's look at the periods and mechanisms more closely. The first period uh, starts in 1984 uh, when the PKK declared its anti-colonial arms struggle and ends in 1999 when the PKK declared a ceasefire following the Turkish, Turkish state's arrest of the PKK leader, Abdullah Öcalan. This period uh, features survival processes of the displaced Kurds and the Kurdish political movement. In this period, uh, the identities and stories of uh, Kurdish forced migrants were animated by the colonial state violence. On this, uh, I would like to share a quote by one of my interviewees, uh, Hebun. Hebun says, beginning of the quote, what I can directly tell you is the forced displacement of the people in the 1990s had a particular impact on the identity of Kurds. We were ordinary Kurds when, the, when we were in our villages. However, we have all become political Kurds with the burning of our villages and the killing of our people. Our political consciousness about our identity has increased with the displacement since the attack was directed to our Kurdishness. That's why wherever we have migrated, we have claimed our Kurdishness by our political activities." End of quote. Hebun's quote is a representative account uh, that situates the forced displacement as an attack to Kurdishness and explains how this has transformed their political stance vis-a-vis -vis the Turkish state in their resettled areas, be, be it in Turkey, Western Turkey, or European cities. And direct state violence uh, in the form of forced migration and enforced disappearances, intertwining with landlessness or dispossession, lack of proper housing, unemployment, exploitation, malnutrition, racism, and marginalization in the resettled areas created layers of everyday violence for Kurds. Yet, uh, Kurdish forced migrants uh, have not been the passive victims. Rather, uh, they have actively engaged in shaping the socio-special uh, environment of everyday life in both the center and periphery of Turkish metropolises through their integration as cheap labor in the labor market, through forming their own neighborhoods based on their traditional sociocultural activities, and through their political actions against the state violence. This uh, activated identity boundaries that separated the Kurds from the Turks and led Kurds to build their own understanding of identity and territoriality that strives to decolonize Kurdishness and Kurdistan. This in, for, in turn uh, informed uh, mobilization strategies of both Kurdish forced migrants and the Kurdish political movement uh, in the form of uh, transnational networks of community organizations and political party branches. Therefore, uh, the number of hometown associations from Northern Kurdistan and local branches of the pro-Kurdish political parties increased particularly in the West of Turkey and Central Europe through the initiatives of these migrants. The forced migrants mobilization has also transformed the political registers of the Kurdish political movement. By the early 1990s, uh, with the mobilization of forced migrants, the Kurdish political movement exhibited two political registers that oscillated between legal and illegal zones, what I call on gray zones of Kurdish activism. On the one hand, uh, there was the armed guerrilla uh, force of the PKK, which was criminalized by the international bodies through the Turkish state's lobbying activities. On the other hand, there existed a legal register organized around the parliamentary politics of left parties and by civic activism, including civil society organizations within the new political sphere structured by the neoliberal global transformation. In the late 1990s, uh, many new associations 
is performed uh, and the number of civil society organizations focusing on different aspects of forced displacement to urban centers grew in Kurdistan, Turkey and Europe. As a parallel development to this shift uh, in the organizational form of the Kurdish political movement, the mobilization of forced migrants uh, prompted several new developments, uh, including a shift in the repertoire of actions um, that resulted uh, in the transnationalization of the movement, what is called upward scale shift. First of these actions uh, was the practice of what is called legal mobilization, uh, using judicial means or courts to advance movement goals with a human rights based perspective. An extended uh, network of lawyers within human rights organizations was formed uh, by the Kurdish political movement uh, to provide legal support to forced migrants, while simultaneously applying to the European Court of Human Rights to seek justice for their losses during the late 1990s. The second uh, was the many uprisings called Sarhildans in Kurdish as crucial forms of action that occurred between the 1919 and the 1993 in towns across northern Kurdistan uh, where Kurds uh, basically claimed their identity and demonstrated their support for the PKK on a mass scale, uh, as well as created stories of Kurdish resistance. The third uh, involved the strengthening of the organizational networks uh, of the PKK and mobilization of the larger forced migrant communities in Europe through cultural centers and political organizations. The fourth uh, witnessed the introduction of new instruments, uh, such as broadcasting in Kurdish via the first Kurdish television channel, the formation of several news agencies, and the establishment of numerous magazines, newsletters, and book publishers in Europe. Taken together, um, through these innovations in the movement's repertoire of action and organizational form, Kurdish forced migrants' mobilization transformed the Kurdish struggle from a local one to one which was regional and transnational. And this brings me to the second period in which uh, I will discuss the process of civil society formation and forced migrants heightened mobilization. The second period uh, starts in 2000 uh, with the aftermath of the PKK's unilateral ceasefire this period, what I call the civil society formation process, ends on September 1st, 1999, uh, sorry, 2009, uh, when the Kurdish political movement uh, publicly declared its democratic autonomy from the Turkish colonial rule in northern Kurdistan. During this period, uh, the PKK's objective uh, changed from one of state building for an independent Kurdistan to one of society building, uh, which was conceptualized as democratic confederalism by the imprisoned PKK leader Abdullah Öcalan. Um, in order to understand this shift, uh, I examined the PKK leadership uh, and catch the analysis of the sociopolitical conditions of scattered societies, particularly the Kurdish ones uh, across the Middle East and Europe. Such an analysis shows that uh, forced migration and forced migrants mobilization or activism played a key role in the organizational and ideological transformation of the Kurdish political movement. This was a shift away from a hierarchical understanding of power uh, centralized in the hands of a state or a cadre party towards popular forms of self-administration by the community. The result uh, was a new concept of independence one that relies on self-rule and direct democracy rather than on statehood, borders, and nationalism. This model uh, uh, also aimed at generating a meaningful radical alternative system of self-determination led by women that would eventually decolonize the Kurds. In this period, um, the movement's organizational flexibility and heightened transnational mobilization of Kurdish forced migrants and their crystallized political identities occurred as prominent mechanisms that led the civil society formation process for the Kurdish political movement. In this process, um, especially forced migrant women took the leading role in enacting the new organizational model. Separate civil and military structures 
political parties and self-defense forces were advanced on and across Kurdistan, Turkey, and Europe. During this period, civil society activism uh, was central to the movement's political struggle. In line with the democratic confederal model, numerous neighborhood assemblies, youth and women associations, communes, cooperatives, and organizations were established by diverse religious and ethnic forced migrant groups across the region and Europe. The shift uh, towards establishing and strengthening civil society and forming diverse civil society organizations uh, was accompanied by expanding the local branches of the legal parties and developing alternative forms of municipal politics. Most importantly, um, forced migrants were the primary agents of enacting democratic confederal model particularly in, in the urban centers of Turkey and Europe. Therefore, uh, most Kurdish civil society organizations and pro-Kurdish municipalities that were formed in this period prioritized the needs and demands of displaced Kurds and their mobilization in ways that uh, went beyond the legal mobilization, which was based on the discourse of human rights violation. This, uh, I would say instead, offered a decolonizing perspective for the formation of a Kurdish civil society. Let me tell you more about the um, influences of these developments through the third period. This period uh, begins with 2009 and ends with Istanbul's mayoral election in Ju June 2019. During this period, uh, the Kurdish political movement, equipped by an efficiently organized web of global networks of civil society, continued to further its project of decolonization by aiming to transform the society in a revolutionary way, strengthening the um, potential for resistance within the community, challenging the state's perspective and national state borders in the region and Europe, and reminding the people of their communal strength. In this period, uh, the Kurdish political movements um, increased power together with the regional developments, particularly with the Rojava revolution in North and East Syria, and the emergence of a democratic confederal structure led by the Kurds in Rojava was perceived as a threat by the Turkish state. And it's still the case, actually. And these developments had a significant effect on the peace negotiations between the PKK and the Turkish state. The Turkish state aimed to contain and demobilize the Kurdish political movement through peace negotiations. The Justice and Development Party, AKP, or I should say Erdogan's government, however, uh, failed in achieving its objectives as the Kobane uprisings in 2014 and the June 2015 general elections demonstrated. The AKP's failure in the elections um, overlapped with an emerging radical youth politics in Kurdistan. The result was urban warfare between the Turkish security forces and Kurdish youth militants in cities and towns of Kurdistan, during which the Turkish state um, employed enemy-centric counterinsurgency strategies and carried out the second episode of displacement. Many neighborhoods and towns were destroyed, hundreds of unarmed residents were killed, and a political crackdown on the oppositional groups, particularly Kurds, was initiated. Many resources uh, formed during the civil society formation and self-determination processes of Kurdish political movement were confiscated by the Turkish state following the urban warfare and the failed coup d'etat in 2016. The emergence of uh, political threats uh, with the AKP's enemy-centric counterinsurgency strategies during and after the urban warfare uh, limited the Kurdish political movement's activities in gray zones of activism, both within and across Turkish borders. And in a situation uh, where the political access in Turkey was confined to electoral politics and conditioned by the AKP's repressive strategies, the grievances of Kurds um, were shaped by frustrated rising expectations and mobilized by the Kurdish political movement to defeat Turkish state's objectives of creating desired citizen subjects from Kurds, even in their resettled areas. Marked by the Kurds' frustrated rising expectations, the Kurdish votes, as they are called, 
uh, particularly of forced migrants in Istanbul, played a key role in defeating the AKP's 25 years long political control in Istanbul. They proved to be a significant actor of political change in both Kurdish contentious politics and Turkish politics. To summarize, um, the Turkish state uh, used forced displacement as counterinsurgency strategy to create loyal Turkified subjects and controllable territories. This particular form of forced displacement has paradoxically resulted in an increase in Kurdish mobilization, which in turn has uh, provided Kurds with uh, diverse mobilization strategies to build their collective identity and stories, extend their resources, and establish strong glo global grassroots organizing that strives to decolonize Kurdishness and Kurdistan. To put it differently, um, Kurds made, made their displacement to work for their benefits through the mechanisms of spatial distribution, building up their own understanding of identity and territoriality, upward scale shift, and organizational flexibility for an ideological change. Uh, drawing on these insights, uh, my research about the impacts of first displacement on the dynamics of political mobilization in the Kurdish contentious politics makes three main contributions to the existing literature. First, uh, by critically engaging with literatures on dynamics of contentious politics and forced migration and bringing them into conversation, uh, I identified four mechanisms that are critical to understand the impacts of forced displacement on dynamics of political mobilization in the example of Kurdish contentious politics. By analyzing these mechanisms, um, I have demonstrated that forced displacement acts as a movement catalyst in Kurdish contentious politics, and it is central to understanding the intensification of political mobilization that forges transnational and multi-local networks of civil society. Second, by focusing uh, on the mobilization strategies of forced migrants, uh, I reject depictions of displaced populations that do not acknowledge their agency and ability to build forms of resistance, identity, and community, uh, even in the face of efforts to deny their very existence and impose set their colonial objectives. Instead, um, I propose that displaced communities are political actors who can come to wield significant power through transnational activism that challenges and contests the displacing settler colonial state and border violence. My research um, contributes to this literature by unpacking the impacts of forced migrants mobilization strategies on their struggle for liberation. In doing so, uh, my research uh, challenges methodological nationalism and methodological uh, statism, uh, and that's my third contribution. In the last two decades, uh, critical scholars in migration studies have eloquently argued, argued that um, the legal categories and binaries such as refugee versus economic migrants, internal versus external displacement, do not function as instruments of inclusion. Rather, they reproduce exclusion. And these legal categories serve dominant political interests that aim to discipline life and knowledge. And international legal categories also normalize statist and colonial perspectives in both research and policy. Scholars uh, have criticized uh, the methodological and analytical separation of external and internal in the national state in social sciences. And acknowledging these limitations in the studies of forced migration, I focus on both forced migrants who cross the uh, colonial national state borders and those who stayed inside of these borders through the contentious politics lenses. In doing so, uh, my research extends the scope of forced migration studies by unpacking the cross-border mobilization strategies of forced migrants and not reproducing the centrality of colonial national state borders in the analysis. Uh, I think I will stop here. Uh, thank you for listening and I'm looking forward to hearing your questions.